Hello, everybody. Welcome to the um, first uh, PFS 2018 um, webinar. It's 1 p.m. We will give everybody just a few more minutes to log in. We have Jessica Dickin with us, and as well as Basil and Elizabeth, to um, talk about those really exciting and really important things we, we all need to know related to um, PFS 2018. Currently, everybody is, you're in mute only mode, meaning um, you're muted by the system. In just a few minutes, you will be unmuted by the system, which means we will be able to hear you. Um, so we really want folks to mute themselves on their end. That will allow us to have a, a better conversation via audio if you want to chime in by simply unmuting yourself on your phone. Uh, plus, Elizabeth will be providing everybody the opportunity to introduce themselves via audio connection. So that's really important um, to um, do so. If you have any problems or concerns, please uh, let us know. We have a question and answer box. Under questions within your GoToWebinar control panel, if, uh, any questions you have, please uh, feel free to post those or chime in via audio. We will track questions as well. If you have any audio issues, let us know. We've had some reports of intermittent audio connection problems, so um, we'll work on those as we go along. We, the audio um, and the video for the webinar is being recorded. So this is in the public space and will be available um, after editing. Um, Basil and Elizabeth will make sure that uh, they provide the link. Plus the materials from today will also be available too. Um, Elizabeth, are you about ready to, to start? Yes, I am. Okay, I'm, I'm going to turn myself off. So everybody should see a um, PFS 2018 community launch slide deck. And in the meantime, I will begin the, the process to unmute everyone attending. Uh, please note that there are 22 people collectively on the webinar. So we are concerned about background noise. So if we have to start selectively muting individuals, um, um, that's for the good of the calls. And if you uh, need to make a comment and happen to be um, on mute, um, we'll make sure to, um, to provide you um, audio access again. Thanks so much. And Elizabeth, take it away. Great. Thank you so much, Jamie. I appreciate all the help you've um, given to us for this webinar. And I want to welcome everyone. This is really exciting. All of us that have been waiting for this webinar to occur and to welcome people and congratulate people. And um, I wanted to show you and, and to do more. So what we're going to be covering today is getting to know each other. And in this webinar, it's we're going to be telling you a lot of information. From the For the rest of the four years, we want more feedback from you than we're allowing you to give this webinar. But this is just our kickstart. We're going to see what the state is requiring, what our vision is um, through this grant, how we're going to be learning together throughout the next four years. We both have expectations. We, the staff at um, that are staffing this grant, have expectations, and I am sure that you have expectations of us. And then at the end, we want you to supply us with questions. And if you have questions that come up after the webinar is done, you can contact me. So I'd like to start with introductions. And I'd like to, um, Jessica to start off and then go, I believe Michael and Kendall are starting, are sitting in with us. So if you can announce yourself and tell us your title and role, that would be great. Oh boy, no pressure. Okay, my title. Well, good morning, or it's not even morning anymore. My goodness. <laughs> good afternoon. I'm Jessica Dickin, and I am the section chief for the Division of Mental Health. And I believe it's the wellness prevention and community integration team here at the Division of Mental Health. 
And my primary role is that I am in charge of reporting all of our good work to our federal funder, SAMHSA. And so in order to do that, I'm also setting up budgets and contracts and paying all of you to do this good work and making sure that the APNC staff, Basil and Elizabeth, are helping all of you to report so that we can report ultimately to our federal funder. And that's that's my main role here, and I'll be talking a little bit more about that in, in a little bit. But welcome. We're excited to have you here, and I look forward to meeting you soon. Thank you, Jessica. Michael, are you here with us? Michael Eisen? Michael is with us, but is currently having a audio connection issue that we are trying to process out. So, Michael, do you, do you happen to hear us? We may have to circle back around. Well, while he's working on that, um, Kendall, have you joined us? Well, we'll let Michael um, try again. I'd like to have Basil um, yeah. introduce Kendall himself. Kendall's with us. Okay. Is it Basil now? Okay. Uh, yes, I'm very excited to be on here. I am full time directing the PFS grant, so I, this grant has 100% of my attention, or at least 110 or 20%. And this is Elizabeth. I am coordinating um, the. 10 communities that, that you all are a part of now, our team, our community team, and I work 100% and more just to make sure that we are getting everything we expect on books, on both the communities and the staff are getting everything. Background noise. Now is Kendall with us? What about Michael? Okay, well, we'll catch up with them a little bit later. I'd really like to start hearing from our communities. And so what I'm going to ask of you in the order in which they appear on the map, you can see my efforts at trying to be um, a graphic artist. I did not go to school for that, but you can see that we are peppered across North Carolina, and I'd really like to ask people to please state your name or names, if you have more than one person on, representing your community. And then, are you the main contact, or are you going to be hiring someone to work this process full-time throughout the next four years? So I'll go ahead and um, start with Haywood. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is part of the brief Mountain Project. And I'm going to This is really a wild boy from this background. Can you hear me? Hey, Patty, you should have that, though. Okay, this is Patty Tiberi from Mountain Projects in Haywood County. Um, I am currently in the process of advertising to hire a person for this position. Beautiful right now. Thank you, Patty. You're okay, welcome. Elizabeth. Okay, I'm going to swing it over to DARE, which are these blue, you see my mouse swirling around. Amber cannot join us. She is visiting Mickey Mouse this week and had had this vacation planned probably starting, you know, of course, before she heard about it. So we will now turn it over to McDowell. And if you can state your name or names, and if this is your permanent role. Elizabeth, I'm having to unmute everybody manually. Okay. One at a time sure. to decrease the background noise. So um, for McDowell, 
um, Donna Bruce. If you could, yes, Donna. Donna, I'm unmuting you. And if Danielle's hey, on. Donna. Yes. No, Danielle, Donna's here. Danielle. Donna and Danielle, do you have audio? This is Donna. I'm a engine coordinator, but I will see an ad hoc party on hiring, currently advertising the position. Okay, thank you so much. And Jamie, just to get you ready, we are going to swing on over to Anzalo Carteret, and I believe it's Kelly and Megan. And they're going after, like I said, two counties. Yep. Kelly and Megan, you have access. Kelly, simply unmute yourself and I think it'll work. Can you hear us? Yeah, I believe you're still muted on on your end, Kelly. Uh, now try. We are here. Hello, welcome. Okay. Do you want to enter, introduce yourself out there? Hi, I'm Megan on the phone with Flo Carter. Great. Now, Megan, is this your is this your position? Will you be with us for the next four years? Yes. Okay. Well, welcome. Thank you. Okay, now we're going to swing it over to Avery, which is Gretchen Somerville. Gretchen, you have access. Hi, Gretchen. You may be muted. Jamie, can you see if it's working Gretchen, on your end? You're open on my end, so check your phone or your, your computer if it's showing as mute. You, you have system level access. Okay. So we're having a, a, some technical issues with Gretchen. So we might okay. need to swing back around. Okay, so we'll go to Wilson, and it would be under Jeff Hill. Okay, Jeff, you have audio access. All right, thank you. Uh, my name is Jeff Hill. Um, I'm the director with the Wilson County Substance Prevention Coalition. Very excited to be a part of this process, and we will be hiring somebody full-time to take the grant leave. Very good, thank you. Okay, we're going to shoot down to Charlotte Mecklenburg, and that is Melanie and Tamara, or Tamara. Tamara, Tamara, Tamara my apologies, you have audio access. Is Charlotte there? Melanie, you also have access. Hello? Yes. Hello. Hi, yes. My name is Hannah. I'm here to represent the Charlotte Mecklenburg Drug Free Coalition. Welcome, Hannah. Are you Hi. going to be hired on to do this for the next four years or? Uh, no, I am actually um, the chair of the board. Okay. Well, that's great. Thank you for joining us today. Absolutely. No problem. We're excited. Thank you for having me. Okay. Now we're going to shoot over to Johnston County, and that's either Jennifer or Jessica. That would be under McLean 
or Jones. Jennifer, you do have access. Jennifer, can, can you hear us? Okay. okay, we might need to circle back there. And okay. um, I'm working with Gretchen in the background to help her improve her audio connection. So okay. I can move forward. Okay, so we can move now to Forsyth with Terry. What's yours, Forsyth? Sure, no. But, hey, Terry, uh, how are you? Uh, We're good. Billy, and, and Billy. Terry, uh, Billy. Sorry. Okay, go ahead, Kelly. It's yours. Okay, well, this is Terry, and I have with me um, Kelly Grimes, and we have two. Um, new hires on our project that joined us yesterday. Uh, Ashawn Parker will be our PFS coordinator and Kate Egan will offer administrative support to us. And we're really excited about this opportunity. And if I could get you, Elizabeth, to take the E off of Forsyth. Okay, I just noticed that. I'm like, no, that's not supposed to be there. <laughs> right. Thank you. And all right, this well, thank is what you. it's all about. Yeah, that's and right. like thank we're gonna. So Thank you, Terry. And this is what it's all about. We learn from each other. So that's great. And we're going to end up with Fuquay Verena. And let's see if Miss Virginia's there. Hold on one second, Virginia. Okay. Let me. Virginia, you should have. Hi. <laughs> Hi, this is Virginia Johnson. We are representing the Fuquay Verena Coalition for Safe and Drug Free community. Uh, we currently have a part-time coordinator who is Jane Gu, and we're actually looking to hire. We're just posting now a full-time coalition coordinator in Fuqua Verena. And I'm actually here. I apologize. We're all through my phone, but um, for Johnston County as well, if that's okay. <laughs> for Johnston County, we have um, part-time people, which is Jessica Jones and Jennifer McLean, are part-time coordinators for the coalition at the moment. And we're actually um, getting ready to post a full-time position to coordinate the PFS grant for Johnson County. So both of those announcements are going out this week. So. Wonderful, thank you. And if I could add one more thing, is Fuquay Verena should always have a dash between the Fuquay and the Verena. That would be okay, great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else, a, James? has a K instead of an H, C-H. Should be K C K. Okay. I just got a text. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, anyone okay. else, Jamie? Are we rolling on to the next slide? Let's roll on for now and um okay. hold on one second. Um Gretchen may have been able to um correct her um issue. So hold on one moment. Gretchen, can you can you hear us now? Can you hear us? Yes. Would you like to introduce yourself, Gretchen, and, and your team? Hey, sorry, sorry about the technical difficulties. Yeah, hey, this is Gretchen and our web, um, our community health team here, and Jennifer Warren, our executive director. And we will be hiring a full-time position to carry out the um, functions for the PFS grant in Avery County. We have currently have that position open. Wonderful. Thank you so much and welcome. Okay, okay Elizabeth. Um, if, um, if the audience has questions or wants to participate um, via audio, please just raise your hand and I will provide a uh, manual audio app to you to decrease background noise since we're having so many issues. Um, and we'll be happy to provide audio access. Just raise your hand. Thanks so much. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, Jessica, I am now introducing you again 
to really give us what the PFS overview, you know, give us the overview of PFS. Jessica? Jamie, let's let's give her a moment to um, unmute herself. We're working on it right now, so hold on one moment. Thank you for your patience. She's having to, to reestablish her connection, so um, hold on one second. Jessica's still working on, on, her, on her connection on her end. Um, okay. Elizabeth, do you want to um, circle back around to Jessica's part to give her a little bit more time or just... Sure, Basil, um, do you want me to skip to your slides? Sure, let's go, let's go for it. Okay, so I'm, I'm only gonna take a few minutes here because I, I really wanna save as much time as we can about the who for the who and the what and how we're gonna implement this grant, but I wanted to spend a couple of minutes on the why. Uh, why we're doing what we're doing. Um, I'm gonna unpack this with a lot more leisure when we get together face-to-face -face in December for our first quarterly training in Winston-Salem. Um, but I did wanna take three or four minutes and give you a bit of a bird's eye view of the overall project. So let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, you, you all have received a one-pager on that document um, that gives an overview of the project. But I wanted, I wanted to kind of come back to the basics of this and speak for a couple of minutes about how we're really wanting to emphasize both the P and the S of Partnerships for Success and that we are you know, very cognizant of the, the number of um, partnerships that are already in place. Um, that are reflected in the various proposals that have been submitted. So this is kind of like the gold. One is silver, one is gold. There is a new element in here that we're wanting to build new partnerships within the communities that you're working with, which will be going deeper, I think, than what we have been able to go further in terms of bridging some health disparity gaps. And so that's a major overriding um, impetus associated with this grant. And um, I think, you know, when I, when I, I, I tend to go just PFS, 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 but you know, when I stop and think about the partnerships that are ongoing here, there's gonna be a variety of partnerships that we have within our communities, partnerships that we have between the 10 uh, communities that are represented today, and partnerships between all those collective communities and the state. You know, so it's a, it's a, um, a large picture that I'm trying to, to portray here in terms of where we're moving both at the community scale and where we're moving at the state scale through this. And in terms of success, you know, there's a lot of different ways that, that we can 
we, we can measure the success of this grant, but I really wanted to start, you know, like looking at the why issues with a with sense of the end in mind. Where are we going to be four years from now, and how are we going to get there, and how do we measure success? And and one of the things is associated with uh, the SPIF process itself and, and implementing change on issues that haven't been as um, we haven't allocated the time and, and energy and resources on some issues that have been growing that we may be losing track on in terms of uh, e-cigarette increase while, you know, kind of erasing the gains that we've made over the last 10 years in, in terms of tobacco um, and the, the pervasive problem that underage drinking continues to be. And what we've, you know, we've had a lot of attention and funding allocated towards opioid prevention, this grant is specifically supplemental to all that and isn't addressing opioid prevention. So it gives us a chance to, to go back and um, look at how we can reinvent what we've been doing in prevention to be more effective in, with these three substances. Um, and all 10 communities, of course, are focusing on alcohol. Uh, nine are focusing as a second optional target substance on e-cigarettes, and one uh, is focusing on cannabis. Um, again, I think, you know, if we are able to bridge some of these health disparities gaps, this is a, this is a major focus of the grant at large, um, and we'll be spending a lot of the time um, really drilling down into what that means and what we can do about building new partnerships to reach people that we haven't been as effective in reaching in the prevention community. So I just wanted to kind of put that out there today. And another another um, item in terms of how I'm thinking from this grant from the bird's eye view is that collectively we're going to be moving as a prevention field in this state from the individual strategies that we, we will continue to do, but primarily to be focusing on the environmental strategies that we know to be most effective. And um, that's kind of it for the partnership and success. I did want, I did have one more slide and a couple more points that I'd like to make. I think that, that I'm, I'm envisioning wanting to be able to portray a long and a broad and a deep view. And the long term that I'd like to paint here is that this, this, this cohort that's meeting to get today on this bumpy start and getting through all this te technological um, barriers that we're, we're transcending right now, are going to be working together for four years, which is a long time. Um, and, and the kind of change that we can implement when we look at a four-year timescape um, is longer than some of us are used to looking at. And I think that, that we, when we start defining what success means in our communities and what it means in our state, I'm going to continuously be a voice for that long term. Um, view in terms of, for example, thinking of sustainability right out of the gate, day one, not just waiting until um, the end of four years and the last quarter to be thinking about a sustainability plan, but to be weaving it in like cultural competency throughout the entire SPIF process. And the broad view, the breadth is that when, when you look at the, the map that um, Elizabeth put together, 10 communities, roughly geographically, comprises 10% of the state. And when you think about tipping point and making change happen, 10% is a magical number. If you can get 10% of change implemented, then you get early adopters after that, and then, then you have the, um, the people who are lagging behind. <laughs> so I think the, the view that I'm trying to put forward here is that each of your communities is part of something bigger. In, in terms of what we're doing at a state on as part of this PFS grant, both in terms of statewide prevention infrastructure, uh, which is being addressed for all 100 counties, uh, and collegiate networks that we're working in. I'm, I'm, if you do the math on this project, and and each of the, the communities is eligible for $123,000 times 10, that's 1.2 million out of a roughly $2 million project. So over half the money is going towards the community scale, but there's also a lot of work that's being done with collegiate networks and uh, in the statewide prevention infrastructure. Again, that I'll be unpacking a little in a little bit more detail when we meet face to face. But I wanted to just kind of put that out there 
um, that this is this is not just 10 community grants. This is a cohort of 10 communities that are working together um, to change prevention in the state of North Carolina. And then finally, the deep view is um, connecting to a deeper focus within our within our individual communities that are represented in this grant. And and that means um, the objectives of the grant, as as were stipulated in the RFP, are to um, to bridge these health disparity gaps, which means we're we're reaching people who we haven't been as effective in reaching prior to this time. So we kind of have to reinvent our game here, and that's going to be my challenge to uh, continually remind you of these long, broad, and deep views. And so with that, I will pass it back to you, Elizabeth, and or Jessica, if you're ready. Okay, is Jessica ready? I hope so. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. Yay. Okay, so sorry about that. I was talking and nobody could hear me. So you'll see here, these are the goals that I talked about on our webinar uh, from, let's see, I believe we met in August. And these are the general goals that we set forth when we applied to SAMHSA for this funding. So again, we're going to be preventing the onset and reduce the progression of, of underage alcohol use, e-cigarettes, and marijuana use. And Basil just talked about in communities and populations of high need. Again, we're, we're going to be looking at evaluation results to make North Carolina prevention more effective, and I'm going to be talking about that in a little bit. And then we, Basil also mentioned the prevention infrastructure and the capacity to do some local as well as some state-level change around alcohol, um, marijuana, and e-cigarettes. So again, when you applied, you agreed to do all these things. You're going to be measuring and reporting outcomes. Uh, you're going to be demonstrating your ability to comply with all of these national cross-site requirements. We're, we are focusing on things that prevent use and versus things that are harm reduction. Primarily, we're focusing on underage alcohol use, as well as, as all of you, or most of you are focusing on e-cigarettes. And then we're going to be looking at subpopulations affected by those health disparities or health equity issues and looking at strategies to address um, underage alcohol use with this population. So I think it's important to talk through who you should call when you have questions about this particular grant. And most of you have said that, um, or you've heard a little bit more about Basil and Elizabeth's role, and you've heard a little bit about my role, but primarily what I'm doing is the, the fiscal and the, and the I'm, I'm the spokesperson for this grant, and we, I work closely with Basil and Elizabeth, and you'll see all of our titles here. Um, but I do have to do the final uh, reporting to, to SAMHSA as well as the fiscal oversight. Basil and Elizabeth uh, do program oversight, and, and Elizabeth will be working directly with all of you in the 10 communities. We also have a couple other people that folks will recognize, Sarah Potter, who is the executive director at APNC. She provides assistance to Basil and Elizabeth and also coordinates with our office here at the Division of Mental Health in terms of some of the grant oversight. We're looking to hire a lead evaluator. I know some of you put in your applications that you're going to have some evaluation in your grant which will be interesting, but we also need you to follow and, and talk with our lead evaluator um, as we go forward into this process. You may find that not all of what you need in your grant application or in, in your budget is what you're actually going to um, end up doing. So with that in mind, we can go to the next slide. Thank you. So in general, um, our, our team did a, uh, I think it was a six person team from various different um, places around the Division of Mental Health and the Division of Public Health. We had staff do a uh, fiscal and a, a scope of work in your application review. And I wanted to give you some oversight as to some themes that we saw across the board with budgets. So for example, we really needed some more detail in your budget narrative. So you, you might have mentioned, oh, I want to have uh, mileage for staff. Well, you know, what kind of mileage for what purpose? or I want to do staff training or staff development and here's the amount. What particular staff training do you want to have done? And so on and so forth. Um, what, 
what we'll be doing is I'll be scheduling a call with you, uh, probably a webinar meeting where we can go through your, your budget and we can talk through particular pieces and questions that I, I'd had as a result of reviewing everybody's budgets. I also need you to describe for us whether or not it's an ongoing cost, like you'll have this for the remainder of, of the PFS grant, or if it's a startup cost. You know, typically startup costs are things like computers or, you know, the computer software, or uh, we needed to have a printer or whatever. Those are typically those uh, startup costs, but we just need to have some designation between the ongoing and startup. And some of you did that, and then some of you, again, did not. Some of you also didn't include training or travel costs for that PFS coordinator to come to our training. And our first training is going to be in December. And I know we've got some online webinars too that Basil and Elizabeth will talk more about. The webinars usually don't cost anything except time, but we do have some um, travel requirements that we'll need you to build into your budget that some of you may, have, may or may not have done. And then finally, um, I noticed as a result of, of looking through your budgets, some of you um, didn't spend all the money that you said you were going to, and then some of you spent a little bit more than you should have. <laughs> so we'll look at that as well. It's nothing that needs to be, um, don't, don't panic. It's, it's not a big deal. Um, it, it certainly doesn't affect your overall amount. It just it means that we need to do a little bit of tweaking as we talk through this in, in October and early November. And next slide. So as I mentioned or I alluded to before, flexibility is going to be key. Not everything that you propose in your application in that 10-page narrative will you be able to do this year. Um, some of you mentioned a lot of work that you'd already done around alcohol use. And what we're really wanting you to focus in on is, and for some of you this will feel like, oh, I'm, maybe I'm taking a step back. But we noticed that a lot of you don't have very good e-cigarette or marijuana data. And for those of you who are working on e-cigarettes, it's important that we know what exactly we need to be addressing and, and having some of that local data will be really critical. Um, and so again, it's, it's getting through and looking at the needs assessment as it relates to your, either your, your substance of e-cigarettes or marijuana. And it's also looking back to see if you've done some work in the past around alcohol, you know, how can you let us know that what you've been doing has been effective? So what's the level of change that has occurred in your local communities? Um, have you seen a difference between the, when you first started doing something and then to now? Is there any kind of information that you can share with us that um, would show a some kind of behavior change over time? Because I think I think what we typically do in prevention is we get kind of bogged down and we, we do what we've always done because we know how to do it, it feels comfortable, and I think one of the things that I saw as a result of the last grant that we received, the Partnerships for Success uh, program, is that we did a really good job in building capacity of our communities to address opioids. But what we didn't necessarily do is we didn't track whether or not there was behavior change. So whether or not um, youth felt that marijuana use was more harmful as a result of our work or whether or not there was more local ordinances passed around, um, you know, noise ordinances, or whether or not there was better local festival and event restrictions around alcohol. We didn't really show, we didn't do a good job of showing our the hard work that we had accomplished over the, the course of the last grant cycle, and that's what I'd really like to see us do. Um, I can't stress that enough. I don't want us to come to year three and year four and wonder, hmm, did we do anything to make a difference? The other thing um, I think it's really important to think about is just because it's a need, just because we've identified it, it doesn't mean that your community is ready. They are not, may not be ready for some of the work that you're wanting to do, and I think that's also going to be very critical as you think about doing this work. Some of you have been doing work um, in coalitions or as a prevention provider for decades. And a lot of you have described to me that sometimes you're a one-man band. 
And if you don't have any local support or any other people who are coming to the table to help you do some of this work, then it becomes very lo <laughs> very lonely. <clears throat> and so anyway, I think it's going to be important to think through some things. And so I want you to realize this is not just a grant that we're giving you money to do strategies that you've always done. I think it's going to be really critical to think through the local data, especially as it relates to e-cigarettes and marijuana, and look at your alcohol indicators as well. But I think going forward, just keep that in mind that what you wrote was great in your application, but it may not be all of the things that you're going to end up doing, especially after this this first funding year. Um, and it may not be even in the second funding year. It, it's it, it's going to evolve and it's going to change. And like I said, flexibility really is is the key. So I think that's oh. So I have a couple of days and times here that you can we can set up. Um, and and Jamie, perhaps we can work through the best way to do this. But I envision just needing to speak with a representative from your prevention agency or your coalition to talk through a little bit about your budget. And as it relates to your application, it shouldn't take very long. Um, I've got notes that I can send you ahead of time, kind of things that I needed some more um, help on or just some more clarification. But I, I would imagine it would take about half an hour to 45 minutes to just talk through that. I do want to say that since we awarded your um, or we given you the notice of award, I've reached out to, and again, for those of you who are prevention providers, you'll understand this more than others, but I reached out to most of the LMEs, and most of them are willing to accept new people into their network. So, and I can talk with you about that more too um, in October or November. I've gotten responses from, let's see, five, four out of the five LMEs that are that have counties that are in this grant, and most people, like I said, are willing to do to accept all of the allocations. And so it shouldn't be too much of a long-term process to get the money. But again, I'll talk with all of you about where we're at uh, individually with that. But I have been doing some work behind the scenes to get that money hopefully quickly out the door and in your community so that you can start doing this process. Does anybody have questions um, so far about this or do we need Need to move on and ask for questions later. It's up to you. Okay. Well, I will stay on the car, and we'll. I can certainly help answer questions as need be toward the end. Thank you so much. Okay. Yep. Jessica, let's let's hold on one second. I may okay. have a question. Okay. Um, Kelly, um, then an onslow. Do you have a question or? I do have a question. Um, and sure. this may be a one-on-one -on -one question. Does okay. just have any time frame of when we're getting our contracts from our LME? Uh, so they have, uh, your LME has agreed to accept that. And all I have to do is send in a scope and your budget. Perfect. And okay. you should, they should be willing to do that fairly quickly. And I say fairly quickly because you know how quickly the state works, which is, It'll take a couple of weeks. Yes. Okay. <laughs> At least. That's, that's what I want to know. Okay. Perfect. Yep. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank and by you. the way, Kelly, I already sent Trillium your, I believe your budget and scope of work. So they have okay. a, a good sense of where you started. So. Okay. Perfect. Okay. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. I, I think we have all clear. Okay, I don't want to take away too much time from the other important stuff. So I will uh, mute myself and hopefully you'll be able to hear me if I need, need to help. Thank you, everybody. Okay, Elizabeth, I think it's, it's um, back to you. Elizabeth, you still with us? Oh, 
Hello, Elizabeth. You're ready to go. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, I, I don't know where it broke off, but let me get my mouse away from that mute button. Um, we, this is the point where I say, okay, this is what we expect from you as a team and as a state, and also what you can expect from us. And that's going to vary. We're going to we're going to see how that when working together, it's going to be a dynamic collaborative process. We're going to get to know each other very well. And um, I need to advance those slides, but okay. So we're really looking at a multi-layered approach. And what I mean by that is you're going to have targeted and individualized monthly TA plans. And so this is why we really need to have one person that is assigned to this grant that is the main contact. And then the, if there are others, if you have um, the capacity to have someone else working, you know, part time on this, along with the well, you know, the full time person, that's great. Because I want to have those calls with you, not just to check off the box, but to also say, you know, what, what is it you really need from us? Let me see if I can find an answer for you. And through those, we're going to be having quarterly trainings and interim webinars on a variety of topics. I want to hear back from you all on what you want, who you want to hear from, and what you want to hear about. You know, whether it's law enforcement or faith based or someone talking about cannabis or um, tobacco, you know, e cigarettes. We're also going to be doing that wonderful strategic prevention framework. So we're going to need to have support documentations. And this is really not something I want you to fill out and then put on your bookshelf or fill out and then stick it in a file in your computer. We are going to make sure that this all makes sense and that this is going to be a fluid process of filling out these documentations. And along with that, we want to individually pace because not everybody, as we've heard from different people, some new people are being hired on, some people have been doing this for 15 plus years, they're going to be doing things at a different pace and we welcome that. We don't want someone to be stymied because, oh, they've gone too far and, and they have to stop. We want people to flow at their own pace, but also to be able to keep up. So if we need to have something done, and you're finding difficulties, that's where I come in. Okay, how can we look at this differently? How can we pull in some resources? We do have designated staff and office hours within us, but also are looking at you for that one-time full-time person that we are basically working uh, during the same office hours. And also we are going to have office hours where maybe it's a Friday from one to two. We're still coming up with this. We need feedback from you all. And where you can just call in and say, okay, I'm having a question about this. And maybe, you know, Haywood has a question and Dare has the answer. So it's not just us with the answers, but it's everybody. And those won't be, um, you know, you have to do those or else. Those are if, okay, on a Friday afternoon, I need to touch base with someone, I can pick up the phone and know someone's going to be there. And like I said, it all comes back to collective resources and expertise. So we learn from each other. I learn from you, you learn from me. And most importantly, when I think about this is that we're breaking down those silos. So the state is learning from you. The college communities in the communities you're serving are learning from you, you're learning from them. And so what we expect is to really do the spiff. And I know some of you are on here and remember the day we came up with the spiff dance. We will not be doing that. We will not be doing a spiff song, but we will be going through and assessing the needs. And the way we're building that up is if you go down to the final bullet, we're infusing into this process health disparities. So yes, we can assess Avery County, but within that, there's a subpopulation. There's a subpopulation in Forsyth County. There's a subpopulation in all of your counties. And then within that, we need to assess of those subpopulations, is it male or female? Is it the 18 year olds or the nine year olds? So we need to really dig, dig, dig deeper as Basil had said. And throughout doing that, we're gonna be building capacity, not only 
with our own team, but with people throughout the state hearing about what's happening in the field, boots on the ground. We really need to feed that up channel. And then engage in the strategic planning process. We wanna make sure we're planning. And when we're planning, we're hitting our subpopulation and they are involved in the planning process. And then implementation, of course, we really wanna focus on that. As Jessica said, we know how to build capacity and a lot of capacity throughout the years has been built in the state of North Carolina. We need to focus more on implementing what we've learned and what we've learned based on our assessments. And then of course of evaluation, it was good to see that people were already thinking about that. We have this going on, we're using, you know, um, an evaluator. We will have our own evaluator, but you will be drilling down into that subpopulation. I've heard from some state officials that we just can't get the information on subpopulations. This is your opportunity to go quite a few steps further, drill down, whether it's through your own surveys, through focus groups, which really do well, and then passing your knowledge up the, you know, to the colleges and to the state. And like I said, I've infused um, health disparities throughout all of this. We'll be infusing sustainability through this and also evaluating everything, your process evaluation and what you see, are we moving the needle? What do we need to do to change the process? And as you're thinking, I've heard quite a few people as I'm looking over my notes here, that you will be hiring some new folks. And I think that is really exciting. And so when you're looking for a full-time grant coordinator, this person needs to be able to understand um, the local conditions and why is underage, you know, why are things happening? You know, why is it happening here? Um, to plan and mobilize the community to address these local conditions. Remember, these are our local conditions. It's not, all of you are so different. And so when, when you're working on this, you'll be able to look at who needs the most attention and develop and implement that plan focused on that subpopulation. And also because you're doing environmental strategies, it's going to affect the whole community. And of course, you're going to need to complete those tools. And as I said before, you're not going to complete them and file them away. You're going to be using them before our training. We will have homework even before we first meet. And I will be having TA calls. We're going to be using that during our trainings. And then after the trainings, this feeds into our next step. To do this, we need to make sure that we have our monthly TA calls and quarterly trainings and specialized webinars. And those you must attend because if you don't, we will be recording webinars, but it's so much better if you have a question you can ask right then and there. In evaluation, you really should be able to not be scared of evaluation. We have another slide touching on this. And we need to make sure that your budgets are reflecting and are relevant to what you're working on. So if you need to, you know, develop a, a, some focus group materials, use those budgets, use that budget, but it'll have to be authorized. And then quarterly reports, we have to make sure that we're letting the state know and the feds know that what we're doing is what we're supposed to be doing. It just, it's as simple as that. And this is, I know some of you are like, oh, the SPIF experience again. Well, this isn't your typical one. You all, who, who is, whoever is the full-time person, will be part of a statewide team. We really want to make a difference and feed our knowledge and expertise statewide. And then for those of you that have had a great deal of experience, this, give, this gives you time to develop it even further. Remember, 40 hours a week. I remember I worked on an initiative before where you're only funded 20 hours a week. This is a full-time gig. And we're going to week deep, we're going to work deeper and have a targeted focus. Remember those subpopulations, health disparities. And communicating on a different scale, it's not only how often, but how we do it. 
we're going to start looking at a different type of learning experience and a different type of communica communication experience so that you have the power to go in and find your resources when you need them. And then we want to set and reach our goals at your own pace with the capacity of the agency or coalition and the coordinator in mind. We don't want someone to jump ahead and not have really learned what they're supposed to learn just because they're falling behind. And this is what I was alluding to earlier. As you're hiring, we really like someone who's an excellent communicator because they're going to have to work with diverse populations. And working with diverse populations, you have to be a really good listener. You have to listen because so many times we come in with our own lens on and we think that's what we're seeing is the truth. But if you borrow someone else's lens or let them talk, you get to that subpopulation's truth. And with that, being able to do those, you will be a good community mobilizer. And we also would like someone that's, that does have comprehension of environmental strategies if they don't, we do have materials that we, we will be supplying you. And we want someone that wants to get out from behind the desk, that wants to go to meetings that another organi organization is having so that you can get to know your whole community through others' lenses. And we want someone that's not afraid of data. It can be scary but you are going to have to collect it and know, a, we don't want a statistician, but you ought to be able to review it and understand what it means. And the nice to haves is techno technologically savvy because we will be using Zoom, we'll be using other, you maybe you're collecting data and you're using SurveyMonkey, you know, something like that. Um, past work with policy development and implementation, as we look at our different strategies, policy I come from public health, really makes the biggest difference for the least amount of money. And then if you have worked within substance use prevention, that's a plus, but I know that there's quite a few whippersnappers out there that can learn, learn what we have. And you're probably wondering what's, what's coming down the pike? Well, December, we have December 3rd and 4th is our first face-to-face -face meeting. And then in February, we're looking at another meeting towards the end of February. We realize some people are going to CADCA. Some people would like to celebrate Valentine's Day. And then April, we're keeping in mind that there's April break. So that might be towards the end. In July, we know that's heavy vacation time, but that's, that's our implementation. So we can, December, February, and April are pretty much in stone but July might switch to August. We have to keep an open mind about this. And what's happening from now, if you really want to figure out what you're doing from now until December 31st, we do have a webinar that's coming up on November 6th, but before we have that, we are going to be sending you tools, uh, one, the agency assessment or the coalition assessment. You know, where are you with getting ready to fulfill the requirements and your capacity tools. So we want those finished before we meet. And we also, I know you're sounded like all of you are working on this if you don't already have one, a full-time coordinator as soon as possible so they don't miss out. And I will be reaching out by phone. I've already spoken to some of you, but you'll be hearing from me again before the December training. And once again, we are doing sort of a prep for our first training and addressing the homework that we're gonna be handing out and showing you on our next webinar. Like I said, the next training is December 3rd and 4th. That is going to be held in Winston-Salem. I know Dare County has vocalized to me, that's a 10 hour round trip. So we might be holding some others in Raleigh just to give them a break. And I know the West will then be saying, oh, that's a 10 hour round trip, but we have to think about each other. And so um, our face-to-face -face during our training, we're also going to have time to have face-to-face -face TA meeting. So I will have a sign-up list going out to you to sign up 
whether you can come in early on December 3rd, stay after the training on December 3rd, and on both, on both of those days, I'll be meeting with you. In the near, or maybe not so near future, we, will, we really do want to do a site visit. We want to come and see the communities firsthand of what, who we're working with. And then begin your data compilation after, um, after the training for intervening variables. And once again, we did talk about those reporting issues. First quarterly report is due December and we'll give you the tools and how to report. So you don't think you're gonna be creating any type of reporting form. We're gonna be doing that. And then after January through April, we have trainings, we have webinars, we have monthly TA calls, those are monthly, and completion of assessment and planning tools. We'll be digging more into that. And then April is really when we really start doing action planning. <coughs> Excuse me, because like I said, we really want to focus on implementation and making that needle move. We want to show that we didn't just build our capacity, but we turned our capacity into community mobilizers and grassroots efforts to really move that needle. Here's a four year view of what's coming at you. And we're all in on this together. I'm looking at it going, wow, there's a lot there. But I think with developing our team, it's not going to be that challenging. I I'm really expect that. And what you'll receive, um, you, you will get the timelines, timeline of deadlines. And that will be after the first training. And the tools we're going to be giving you, we're not going to throw all the tools at you. We're going to be handing those out progressively as we move through the process. And like we said before, it's, it's self-paced. And training and webinar dates and times will be provided as, as soon as we can. We really, right now, we're, come, we're sorting out the dates for everything coming up this first year. And monthly TA calls, like I said, I want to work with you to figure out which day and time works best for you every month. We'll have those set so that, you know, Tuesday at three o'clock, you're going to get a call from Elizabeth, whether you're ready or not. And then tools for the SPIF process will be used prior, during, and after trainings to guide the work, like we've said before. And I just want to end with this. Well, this isn't my, my last slide, but we're 10 communities strong. And as Basil said, we're 10% of North Carolina, and we really want to set the example. We want to make it a collaborative effort with these 10 counties paving the way. It's a four year long journey. And I think we're really gonna make some headway in learning what strategies are working and send that up to the state and say, yeah, this is working. Or now we need to tweak this. So, our next opportunity to connect, put this on your calendars, please, is November 6th. It's a webinar from 1 to 2 p.m. And it's going to be short and sweet, what you need to expect out of the training and what homework you'll need to do before the training. You will be getting an email from me with timeline and tools to complete by November 5th. And I really want to check in with you to make sure you're not overwhelmed by the timeline that arrives and the tools. And Jamie will be sending out um, very shortly an invitation to the November webinar. I know that was a lot coming at you. So now is your chance to let us know what questions you have. And I don't know, I, I Jessica started it out, well, really Basil did, but are there any, for Jessica specifically, are there any um, questions regarding budget or agency questions that are quick and easy that maybe other people have too that we could discuss online. I'm not sure. Feel free to raise your hand if, if you would um, like to have audio access or, or state your question in the question box. So am I on? This is Basil. 
Am I? Yes. Oh, am I still? Um, I was wondering if you resolved your tech issues, Jamie, with Michael and or Kendall. And I had a specific question for Michael because if if so, I mean, first I would like to give him an opportunity to introduce himself, but also some of the communities have been asking, well, what other communities got awarded? Um, and so this is the first time I think that some folks have seen who who the ten communities are. Like I said, we're 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 dealing into why we're doing this, who's on board, and what and how are we going to be doing. And Michael, I thought it might be um, useful to identify the Putty County since underage drinking is the backbone of this grant, uh, and we have some Putty counties with experience. Um, working on environmental strategies and energy drinking, and I thought this might be a good moment to um, identify those counties if you can, if you if you're on and can hear me. Yeah, Michael, if, if you want to try unmuting yourself, we can we can give it another another try. Kendall, you also have um, audio rights too. If you want to unmute yourself, if you're available still. Does anyone else have any questions? It doesn't sound like Michael or Kendall have the, um, or maybe still have some technical okay. problems. To be continued, then we, we, this is just the beginning, and I, I guess I would I would just underscore that that both Michael and Kendall are on the North Carolina Prevention Team and are providing oversight to part of this process along with Jessica. And uh, since we did have tech issues and they couldn't introduce themselves, and uh, the work that Michael's been doing on underage drinking with a large number, a, a significant number of uh, the people who are on the call today, of course, are going to be building on that. So um, I just wanted to give a nod in that direction and um, move on from there. The um, Melanie sent, sent a message that indicates the Charlotte Mecklenburg Drug Free Coalition um, also receives putty funding as well. Any questions for Elizabeth? And I know some of you are just sitting in until you hire your full-time person, and I'm sure they will have many more. But like Jamie said, this webinar is being recorded. So what I think would really help is when your new folks are on board, we will get a link and they really should watch this webinar just to get a feel of what's expected. And we're going to be recording a lot of our learning opportunities on down the road for people that, but I don't want you to think, oh, well, I'm gonna, I have to miss a training. The trainings really are mandatory. So as you're writing your budget budgets, remember you have December, February, April, and July. So they'll allocate monies based on mileage, food, hotels. Keep that in mind. Elizabeth, uh, Patty does have a question. Patty, are, are you still with us? I am with you. Um, I was wondering, Elizabeth, if part of the trainings would be focused on the different aspects of SPIF. Yes, the trainings, the one in December starts on assessment. And then we will have, we're weaving capacity and sustainability into those. And then in February, it will be on assessment again. We're looking at having the first day be on assessment, the basic um, assessment of SPIF, and then the second day be, being really more on maybe health disparities. Uh, I know in December it will be. It will be on health disparities. And how do we up our assessment to include finding out what those subpopulations are? And then in April, it would be um, planning and 
looking at what strategies you think are going to affect, move that needle in your full population and your subpopulation. And then in July, what is implementation all about? And throughout that, people, we do have some tools for evaluation. And we will be handing out tools and resources as we reach those different segments of the SPIFA. And then are, are we planning this primarily as like a one day training? No, these will be two day. Each each training will be two days. Okay. And it'll either be in Winston Salem or Raleigh. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. You're welcome. Elizabeth. Yes. Um, Michael um, sent me a message. Uh, Putty counties, including Alamance, um, two efforts in Charlotte, a Buckham County effort there, Durham, Forsyth, Fuquay, uh, New Hanover, Orange, Jet, Stokes, Rataga, Wilson. Um, so those are examples of of active Putty sites. So there's That's four great. of the ten community four of the ten communities that are represented here. And Dare also. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think one thing, and Jamie, you may want to respond to this too, because we're we're launching into some um, initial conversations about how we can move beyond webinar. And there was some intention in terms of going through the awkwardness and the tech issues of um audio and all that all that we experienced in the first 10 minutes it wasn't just you know um to have introductions but also in terms of testing out our capacity of what we can do when we up level some technological tools to be able to uh, actually create a dynamic learning community so if we really are up leveling our game and doing bringing prevention to you know into that continuous quality improvement domain across the next four years um, how can technology serve us in that? And I don't know, J Jamie, if you wanted to respond to any of any of those types of um, vision that you had in terms of uh, some of the resources that that we can provide that aren't really in the traditional domain. Sure, we, we, we've been talking about establishing um, online workspaces that are specific to your county and your individual work. It will provide a historical perspective of materials created and uh, processed from day one, but also those workspaces being integrated with your other funded communities. So imagine yourself um, having a online environment that is only for you, that only you and your team can see, and um, your, your funding source in, in Basil and Elizabeth, but also being able to participate in a online community of sorts for the other nine communities so far that, that we've discussed. And um, using that, that online hub, that online community as your primary source for the entire four year period. So not only hopefully we increase communication, but we have a really strong historical record um, from day one. That's one of the challenges we've seen on the TA side with prior um, grants we've assisted with is due to the long length of the, of the grant period and frequently staff turnover, sometimes it's hard to put our hands on the prior work that's been created and frequently at the end of the grant cycle, all of the hard work, documentation, and processes developed uh, frequently dissipate um, from view. And, and that's one of our focus points um, in conversations from the very beginning is making sure that we, from day one, ensure collection of our processes um, so they will stand the test of time beyond year four, year five, so year four specifically. So the, those are some examples we're batting around as well as um, skill building that uh, is on demand online that um, supplements face-to-face uh, -face training that you may receive. So we continue the learning process. So you just don't attend a face-to-face -face training, disappear for a couple of months, then come back. 
we we want our process to be more consistent and, and present um, over the the calendar. I think for anybody that's taken a an online class, uh, my vision of what I'm hearing, some of the opportunities that could be coming our way during these next four years as, as a result of this process is an online class that goes on for four years. It's also, in some respects, kind of like a closed Facebook group. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a small, tight cohort with a long-term relationship. Um, so it, as you were saying, not just a, you know, a quarterly training. Um, and instead of perhaps perceiving ourselves as just students in this online class, maybe we perceive ourselves as mentors and being able to bring the resources in that learning hub to our various communities. So it's like a, a, a cohort of mentors and teachers and the resources that we're working together as a team, you know, as opposed to, oh, I'm, I don't want to take an online class on prevention or I don't, you know, it's, it's, it's beyond that. I think our, our vision for that is uh, really pretty exciting. And I think it has some, it has some potential to uh, bring resources into local communities. Do, do we have any other final um, questions, items that, that we need to address that have not been addressed? We, we've been monitoring the, the question and answer, and, and thank you so much for your, your comments and, and, and processes. Uh, we do apologize for the technical issues. We, we, we seem to have phantoms in the lines today with audio, but um, we have worked that out. We will also be testing out Zoom uh, as part of our processes um, in, in the future. So if you've never used Zoom in the in the past, let us know. We Zoom is our backup PTA web conferencing system that we use as a backup. We may gradually start pushing it to the forward. Um, with PFS as a consistent mannerism and mechanism to test out uh, for state ride and system ride implementation later. So if you, you have if you haven't used Zoom in the past, uh, we'll provide some materials and documentation to do so. And um, last but not least, to um, Basil and Elizabeth and or Jessica, any any final words? Well, this is Basil. I'm just excited, and I'm thankful to all that have brought us to this point. I also want to give a nod to Jessica and all of the prevention team that managed to get this funding out the door with Sarah Potter as quickly as they they did. I've, I've learned a lot about what it takes for this to happen, and even though it's a five-year grant, we have four years of work to be able to do, and, and I saw a few small miracles occur in that process to make that happen. So I wanted to give some gratitude there, and I'm looking forward to seeing everybody in December. Yes, and this is Elizabeth. I cannot wait to meet people. I'm, I'm more of a face-to-face -face person, and I just thank all of you for your efforts in submitting, taking the time to submit an application on behalf of your community because we know communities cannot get the work done without folks that stand up for them and make sure the resources, whether they're monetary or just, um, you know, there's a variety of resources that you're bringing your, to your communities. So I'll be seeing you in December and talking to you before then. Uh, Elizabeth? Yes. One more question um, sure. regarding travel. Uh, as we plan this, were you all Will you all be taking the lead with getting a block of hotel rooms? Because usually you yes. can get a better price than we can. Okay. We will yes. on our end. Um, Patty, for, for all the trainings and face-to-face -face trainings, uh, we'll, we'll follow the, the normal TTA process for room block identification. So okay. during the registration process, uh, for face-to-face -face trainings we'll be, and webinars, we'll be using the, the, the generalized TTA registration process that many of you have, have used before. And um, we will certainly ask um, related to room blocks. So okay. state rate room blocks will be made available to everyone awesome. uh, based on agency pay on, on your, your program pay. Yes, yeah, so big thanks to you, Jamie, to not just for today, but for all of that and all that's coming forward and your team. Great. Thank you all.
Thank you. Um, okay. Of course, last but not least, um, 60 minutes after we uh, end the webinar, you will receive an email from Better Webinar. The email has two components within it, a link for a evaluation and questions um, that you may have pressing that you need Elizabeth and Basil to address. Uh, they will receive the questions that submitted, and you will receive a automatically generated certificate if you logged in via the system. Uh, this webinar was not for certification credit, but it will the certificate acknowledges um, uh, your attendance for the webinar itself. And I would suggest you know keeping track of all those PFS specific certificates and attendance lists and so forth, so you can document your your training as part of the grant from beginning to end. And uh, Elizabeth, I, I will let you um, um, tie things up in a bow. And thanks so much for attending, everybody. Yes, thanks everyone for attending. I know webinars are tough, so I'm going to let you go with no further ado, and we'll connect again November 6th at 1 o'clock. Thank you all.